taking a lot of pills. They're completely counterfeit pills. The police found blue pills in her bag. It is killing by the thousand. This is my youngest daughter, Caitlin. These are the people employing their stories of heartbreak, hoping to communicate a message that this can happen to you. Fentanyl is out there, and it's killing our kids unbeknownst to them. A synthetic opioid, so widespread. She was not a typical user. Its effects are metastasizing to the non-addicted. She had gone to the streets to find a medication to help her with depression. She thought she was taking ketamine for the second time, and it turned out that it was nothing but fentanyl, and she was dead. Ryan was, uh, he had his demons, he had his problems, but he was also a good child. and. A lot of people will say he was a druggie, he was a crackhead. He may have been. I don't know. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say he was. But regardless, he was my son. He was your son? <laughs> yes. And that's what's most important. Correct. And not only did I, did I lose my son, but all these people behind me, they lost a loved one to something that could be taken care of. It basically is a poison. If somebody overdoses, is that they will stop breathing completely. So this is the Narcan kit. Inside we have a vial of Narcan. We have a pulse oximeter to monitor oxygen levels. In Virginia Beach, where 86 people died from fentanyl overdoses in 2021, most of the calls come from areas around the oceanfront. Now, this is probably the hottest of our hot spots for suspected overdose calls. Our first concern is for the safety of the scene and you know, is it safe for us to go in? Um, police always responds with us to overdose calls because there's always the potential that somebody could be become violent. Are they breathing adequately? You know, do they have a pulse? On January 22nd, a 16 year old female. one of those Virginia Beach overdose calls no, not conscious, not breathing. came from Shannon Doyle's house. At nine o'clock that morning, I went upstairs to wake her up. And when I walked in there, it just, like she had stuff coming out of her nose, coming out of her mouth. I shook her, but she was stiff. And when a mom talks about the death of her child, you listen. Every morning I still walk past and look into her room as if she's gonna be there. Maybe that will change, but probably not. Michaela's room, just as the 16-year-old left it, adorned with symbols of her success as an athlete, draped with hope, pointing towards what would have been a bright future. She wanted to go to UVA, and then she wanted to be a lawyer. But somehow, what's killing thousands of Americans made its way to Michaela's possession, disguised as something she knew. I found out that she had at least tried uh, Xanax or Percocet. But packing, a deadly punch. It was pure fentanyl. Police found what looked like opioids, blue pills, in her bed. They are creating a completely new pill. 
that they're marketing as a legitimate prescribed painkiller, but in fact it contains fentanyl. It is killing by the thousands. Virginia, more than 7,000 miles away from where these drugs are conceived. Well, the actual chemicals and substances, they're produced in China. Then sent to Mexico and mixed into a fatal brew. And they're taken to clandestine laboratories. And in the laboratories is where um, it's produced into fentanyl or produced into the pills, the counterfeit pills that contain fentanyl. So how we live, this how we live. The challenge here in Hampton Roads is, and what we're seeing and experiencing, is the drug traffickers in Hampton Roads are now establishing their own sources of supply along the southwest border and in Mexico. This exclusive video shows a dealer who got his fentanyl and heroin from Baltimore before selling it in Hampton Roads. His drugs resulted in the death of a Chesapeake woman. Text messages show he knew he was distributing pure fentanyl. I got to say this video, this time you take a trip to Baltimore going to the fight. And this man is used as someone to test the product. I know, bro. The drugs making him barely able to move. The powder form of fentanyl, approximately a kilogram that was seized here locally in the Hampton Roads area. Enough to kill. 500,000 people. The entire city of Virginia Beach and 40,000 more. What makes fentanyl so deadly is it's a painkiller that's 100 times stronger than morphine and 50 times more powerful than heroin, according to the DEA. Some people addicted to opioids or other drugs turn to it in search of a greater high. Only two milligrams are enough to kill. It leads to a neurological phenomenon that is called dopamine flooding, which basically means there's more dopamine released within the nervous system than the brain naturally is, is able to cope with and able to handle. Um, so as a result, the brain is overwhelmed. Um, and as a result of that feeling of overwhelmed, um, it begins to shut down. And that is the body reacting to an overdose. According to his autopsy report, he had almost four times as much fentanyl in his body than it would have taken to kill him. This is the Tyvek suit. This is our protective suit that we would wear to process fentanyl. If it takes an industrial vent hood for DEA agents to safely process confiscated fentanyl, imagine the vulnerability of an unsuspecting user. <laughs> I've known Michaela for about 16 years of my life. It's important to get the message across that fentanyl is being in different types of drugs and it's being laced in things and it's something that needs to be out into the world that this is happening and it's not, a it's not an overdose as some of the signs say, it's poisoning, people are being poisoned by this. Whoever gave her those drugs, if they knew that it had fentanyl in it or not, that they deserve to be punished for it and to fight for who she was in her life. A police investigation into figuring out where the fentanyl came from is ongoing. Today, Doyle joins her daughter's friends for an awareness march. Out of her grief, mutates advocacy. Try to stay as busy as possible. Yeah. Every once in a while, you know, it'll hit you. Something is said, a song. It can't be in vain. I can't change what it is at this point, but I can try and help save somebody else from having to go through this. A patient comes Every day. It's extremely inconvenient for the patients to get here. We're, you're usually um, kind of a last resort for them. Good morning. Good morning. This is the physical reality on the road to addiction recovery. Daily doses of a synthetic opioid at this pinnacle treatment center become these patients' best way to silent that constant drumbeat of dependency. So they're getting methadone or buprenorphine. 
they verify their identity with the nurse at the window. Or you would tell me your number and then I would also ask you for your dose. The computer automatically doses from a dispenser. So before they leave, they either have to say thank you or goodbye, just so that I can make sure that they swallowed everything. I have a, a pain issue mm -hmm. and um, instead of uh, getting more and more and more pills and pills and pills and pills. I came here to save myself. So you uh, caught yourself? I did. If, and if I hadn't known this existed, I wouldn't be, I don't think I'd be alive today. I really don't. <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, I know so many people who have died. When they're taking like heroin or prescription pills or anything like that, the half-life is really, really short. It gives them a quick high, and then they come crashing down, and they need another hit to keep going. This actually acts like true medication, where you take it, we, we start off low and slow to make sure that we're getting to a proper therapeutic dose. The patients don't feel high, they don't go into withdrawal, it just stabilizes them. Everything that I do, I go to his gravesite and share what I've done. And, and I say, Joey, this is what I did. Kimberly Griffin's son's journey runs through an intersection where mental illness collides with drug use. I saw it all on his face, just down. It was a fatal crossroad for Joey Travieso as depression set the stage for his tragic overdose death. She heals through Joey's Heart, her nonprofit buoyed by inspirational children's books she authored. And then this one is Through Daddy's Eyes. And her magazine, inspired by Joey's challenges. And I named it Bully. But I didn't name it Bully by being harmed or intimidated. I named it Bully about life bullying you, about how life can be a big bully when you have suffered a loss, when you are suffering a sickness, when you are sucked suffering poverty, when you are suffering depression, and how you overcome your situation. And so that's why I named the magazine Bully Magazine. So it's motivational stories about people sharing their testimonies and how they overcame the challenges in life. When medication for Joey's depression couldn't throttle his symptoms. When his dad died, he took a turn for the worse. He looked for ways to self-medicate. So you're feeling this suicidal thought, and you're like, oh, I'm still feeling this way. Let me get something else. Then you're adding to it, and it's worsening it. She'll never forget the sound of the roaring sirens that night in 2019. What, what is all these sirens for? But I didn't know it was for my son. Who lived nearby in Virginia Beach. He turned to several drugs that night, but according to the medical examiner, only one killed him. He had the opioids, he had cocaine, he had marijuana, and he had alcohol. And whatever was mixed in the cocaine, it may have been just a, like she said, teeny pinch of fentanyl. And that's what took him out. The medical examiner said this was an accidental overdose because your son's system was clear. He didn't use drugs like that. He didn't use this drug. The loss of a 27-year-old son, a father. He's always been a good young man. When it first happened, I thought I didn't do enough. But then I said, I did my best. And um, seeing my son in a casket and seeing how peaceful he was, um, I knew I did good. And I know he's on the other side, free. Mm -hmm. I had no intention of getting clean. I wanted to die. And what was that addiction like for you? Well, it totally consumed my every thought. If 31-year-old Sarah Reed can pry herself from the clutch of addiction, then there is hope for others.
started when I was about 15. That's when I really started using pills um, and drinking. And um, it really wasn't a problem until I turned 17. And that's when I was pretty much using daily um, benzos and opiates. Um, but it wasn't until I was 19 that I started using heroin. And uh, I kind of fell in love with that. Um, and I continued to use heroin for almost 10 years. Twists, turns, and tragedy along a bumpy road that included using fentanyl were never enough to slow her pace. I have had multiple overdoses. Um, I can't even count how many times I've overdosed because I would mix pills with heroin, multiple pills with heroin to enhance my high. Um, so that put me at greater risk for overdose. Um, and that never stopped me. I've been hospitalized several times for it. I would just get right up and walk back to another hotel. I've had two boyfriends die of drug overdoses, um, years apart. You know, one was in 2015, one was in 2020. That was actually the year that I got clean and his death did not make me want to get clean. It just happened to be when I started spiraling even more. To where she no longer wanted to live. I had no intention of getting clean. I wanted to die. My goal before I died was to make it back to my mom's house and tell her my story. She made it back to her hometown of Roanoke from where she had dropped out of school in North Carolina, roamed the streets of downtown for hours. I had been wandering around Roanoke all these hours and then I made it back to my mom and that's when my body kind of gave out and I woke up in the ambulance going to the hospital and that's where I begged them for help. You know, I begged them to send me anywhere and they did. They sent me to a psych ward and from there they sent me to an inpatient program. And you haven't looked back since? No. We have so many people that are getting better. Uh, we'll have young people come in and fail a urine test for marijuana and opioids, and they're like, I don't use heroin or any kind of opioid. I said, well, it's in your system. And they're like, I don't know how it would be in my system. Well, it's in the marijuana you're smoking. And so you never know what you're gonna get. Uh, and that lethal dose that could be in one little bit of marijuana or one little bit of cocaine that's got it mixed in it can take your life instantly the first time you use it. Dr. Paul Hardy runs Recovery for Life in Virginia Beach, treatment through group and individual counseling. People are treated here with great compassion. That focuses on the mind and heart. Sarah is one of his survivors and thrivers. I've gained, you know, pride in myself. I've gained respect from my peers and my family. And I think that's one of the biggest things that I like having is, um, you know, respect from my family and them seeing me as strong and able to pull myself out of this. It's over there. You gotta be nice, okay? I missed out on so much, so I want him to have good things to remember. And just, he's a joy to be around. <laughs> he's just, he keeps me smiling. He can get on my nerves sometimes, test my patience, but he's supposed to. When you have someone this young, energetic, precocious, and innocent in your life, there's no room for addiction. This little boy needs his mother. But for half of Brickley's short life, his mom, Allison Bellamy's legal trouble and incarceration kept him separated from her. You can have video visits from in the jail, so that's how I got to watch him grow up. That's how I got to see every milestone. Even before he was born, drug and alcohol addiction made her no stranger to law enforcement. Alcohol drugs, heroin, cocaine. And when she met up with fentanyl, I overdosed and I died. Son's father, my boyfriend, um, he found me on the bedroom floor and he called 911. And when they got there, they had to Narcan me. 
and um, it didn't work. So fortunately for me, because they were ready to pronounce me dead, but my oldest daughter's grandfather is the police chief of Pocosin, and he said no. Hit her again. She lived. I didn't shoot it that night, and I didn't do anything close to what I used to have done. I did something that tiny, and it took me out, and that was my first and only um, experience with fentanyl. We're looking at the place down the street to, because it actually has housing. You learn a lot out here. Y'all, you come spend the day with me, you learn a whole lot. Yeah, I mean, we can, we'll figure that piece out for sure. You can say Jan Brown and her Spirits Work Foundation Center for the Soul helped saved Bellamy's life. She has educated me, she has mentored me, she has inspired me. A big part of what we do is provide recovery support services so that whatever the outcome or whatever it is along the journey that somebody is having, we can be a supportive community for that family or for that mom or for that child. Primarily the women that we work with are in the jail um, and so working with them trying to help. And that's where Bellamy met Brown as Bellamy was serving time for assault on a police officer. We had a lot of people that would come in and tell us what to do, but she just gracefully guided us like it was and educated us and empowered us to want and to do something different. That conceived a connection so strong, Bellamy is now employed by Spirit Works. So we want to work with women and children and so that no other mother has to go through what I did. Come here. I'm gonna go get you an ice cream when we're done. How's that sound? You want some ice cream? Treatment is the key. So it's really about, you know, helping and challenging a person to shift their mind from, you know, I'm an active substance user to I'm a person in recovery. This time I knew that I had to keep going. And what does that really mean from a holistic perspective? I know it won't be maybe six more months I should be done with my recovery. My philosophy is whatever you have to do to get your child, your loved one, uh, whoever it is, parent, adult, spouse, whatever you have to do to get them to treatment. And moving forward on to better things. One of the things in recovery that we learn is you have to change people, places, things, and situations. I sat on my hands, I prayed, I did everything that I had to do to stay. There are rehabs, go get on methadone, suboxone, if maintenance is the path, and keep going. Just get them to treatment. Whatever that keeps you on this earth and alive and breathing. <laughs>